Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome everyone to the SUNY New Pulse Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, today's speaker, as you've heard, is Dr. Danisa uh, Amante Jackson, who's a racial equity strategist and educator. And she's going to speak tonight uh, in a talk titled The Culture of DEI Creating and Manifesting Belonging. Uh, welcome, Dr. Amante Jackson. We're thrilled to have you uh, for what will surely be an enlightening and inspiring program. And for members of the audience, I'll introduce our speaker uh, shortly. Uh, the SUNY New Pulse Distinguished Speaker Series is now in its 13th year, and it's a signature event for the college connecting students, faculty and staff, uh, alumni and community members with well-known authors, policy leaders, scientists, media experts, business people, and other luminaries uh, in pre-pandemic times right here on our campus uh, since the pandemic uh, virtually. Uh, but this program supports our strategic goal to be a cultural and intellectual hub for the region. I want to acknowledge the support of the SUNY New Pulse Foundation uh, that uh, along with the support of many generous uh, sponsors and tonight's attendees makes the Distinguished Speaker Series possible and makes, us, uh, pot makes it possible for us to allow, offer this program free uh, to our students. So thank you all for your, your support. Our sponsors are located in the digital program that we sent you previously, along with the registration link. I wanna thank also Sal Servine from our instructional media services, who's working behind the scenes to support this event. Following the presentation, as Lisa indicated, we'll have a Q and A session uh, that I hope you'll stay for until the program concludes at 6 p.m. Uh, you can place your questions in the chat feature uh, or use the raise hand feature. Over the years, uh, speakers in this series have helped us understand a broad array of social, scientific, political, historical, uh, and other issues. We invited Dr. Amante Jackson to speak today to inform and support our ongoing efforts to become an anti-racist and uh, equitable and inclusive campus community. Dr. Amante Jackson is a racial equity strategist, an educator, a rever reverberating voice for the disenfranchised, and a true champion of the Black, Indigenous, people of color, that is BIPOC community. Pairing her entrepreneurial spirit with a profound commitment to justice and fairness, Dr. Amante Jackson leads efforts to inspire transformative restructuring of organizational cultures uh, within the public and private sectors. She's the successful founder and CEO of two companies. One of those is the Disruptive Equity Education Project, or DEEP, uh, and the other is DEEP Corporate Consulting Partners, or DCCP. These organizations are dedicated to the shared mission of delivering diversity, belonging, equity, and inclusion to individuals, groups, and organizations at the cusp of cultural revolution. Since earning her master's degree in anthropology from Brandeis University, her doctorate in educational leadership from Harvard University, uh, Dr. Amante Jackson uh, has impacted more than 20,000 leaders across more than 100 organizations in 15 states. Additionally, Dr. Amante Jackson is a co-founder and former tri-chair of the Reimagining Integration Diverse Equitable Schools Project on Systemic Change in School, com school Communities at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Before I turn the program over to uh, Dr. Amante Jackson, I will point out to everyone uh, a, a feature of our technology. You'll see in your upper right corner, if you hover with your mouse, the upper right corner of your screen, a button uh, titled Layout. And if you click on that, you can use Stack or Side by Side, which will create uh, a speaker view. So with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Amante Jackson. Thank you so much, and I'm so excited to be with you. And I always, in this Zoom era, like to start my presentations a little bit like the Truman Show. Davina has already told us she's here from the UK, and we know it's almost midnight there. So I'm going to give us a little bit of Truman Show. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. I don't know where we're calling from, but this is a mighty, mighty conversation. Let's grab some pens. That's the teacher in me. There are a lot of notes to take. And I've got time to hear all your questions, well, at least as many as we can get in 15 minutes, okay? And as Erica mentioned in the chat, you will have access to my slide deck. My slides are your slides, okay? So as soon as this presentation is over, you will get that copy. 
And then, you know, there's a lot of support happening here in the chat around my website, but I'm the only Darnie Salmonte and I'm the only Darnie Salmonte Jackson in the entire world. I'm very easy to find. Okay. Just Google me. It's not the arrogance. It's the beauty of being named a Darnisa. Okay. And let's jump right in. So our presentation today is really focusing on this key concept called belonging. And before we even get in there, I kind of want to frame for us that there are a few different places that we're going to go in this presentation, but I have to start with James Baldwin. Okay, we are in a season where all of us feel disempowered. Everybody's wondering what can I do in the face of oppression when there are so many oppressions, there are so many isms, there are so many conversations to have. And the one thing that I want us to all leave this presentation understanding is every single one of us has agency to change the world. It's just a matter of whether you want to take those reins or not. Baldwin reminds us of a very, very important concept, which is not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. There are things that we are going to learn today that your grandchildren will have the answers to. There are things that you're going to learn today and you're not going to be able to take all of it. It doesn't mean you're not brilliant. It doesn't mean that you didn't want to change the world in this lifetime. But oppression is older than the founding of this country. And it takes more than one lifetime to dismantle it. And something that I am always, always encouraged about is that there will be next ones. There will be. Because this work will keep on going, even if we are not here. And I know some of you were like, did she really start her keynote with about talking about mortality? I did, because I want us to accept and expect non-closure. We're not going to get it done in one lifetime. And it doesn't mean you're not successful, right? This is a conversation about how to have agency in this lifetime. And to actually know what you are being called to, what your grandchildren are being called to, what your great great grands are being called to. Some of us in this room might have great great grands. So let me plus it great 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 grands. Because this is work for a whole family over multiple generations. Here's where we're headed today. We're going to spend our time first telling you that the very first step in creating belonging and doing equity or engaging in anti-racism is you actually taking a stance. There are three different ways that you can come to this banquet. And so we're going to learn what those are. And then we're going to spend some time understanding what does it take to get to equity? What is it calling us to do in any space that you live? And we're going to end with what does my agency look like? What can I do either on a campus, in a classroom, in a community, in the grocery store, in your house? And then we're going to have some questions. The first thing I want to present to us is a cycle. And this is a cycle that moves from allyship to co-conspiratorship. This is the stance. There are three different ways that you can show up in a conversation about creating equity or lessening oppression. And I know some of us might think that the term co-conspirator means we're going to run off and we're going to rob something together. It's not a bad term. I just want us to know oppression functions in silence. Okay, it functions because you can't see it. And co-conspiratorship is about the hard stuff that we have to wrestle the privilege we have to name in order to get where we want to go. OK, so it's not being used in a bad way here. And I want us to know. I don't care if you're an ally. OK, Karen, I know you want to edit the shared content. I'm not often in WebEx, but. This is our live slide deck, so I can't allow you to annotate on this one. But if you want to take a screenshot and write on it, please feel free. Um, but it might write on what we're doing now. So I'll start here. There is no judgment in how you show up. I just want us to know that you have choice. An ally is someone who's trying to understand what inequity looks like. And allies are people who are committed to standing with you and saying the thing, 
right? It's, hey, I just learned that this kind of oppression can happen. Stop it. <laughs> but you know, allyship doesn't often mean action. You can be an ally to someone, but do nothing. Allyship is your awareness that the world is not treating people the same way and you wanting to be a partner in conversation, right? The action is a conversation. That's where it stops. And you'll notice that I put in black here, performative allyship is dangerous. When you make a commitment to be an ally, you are actually making a commitment to learning. That's the action. You're learning that the world treats people differently. Okay. An accomplice is one step more than an ally. An accomplice starts to do something called divesting of privilege. Okay. We're going to learn about what privilege is, but privilege is something that you just don't have to worry about. You see, accomplices are acknowledging that there are things we don't have to worry about, that other people have to worry about. And I am willing to let go of some of my privilege, to let go of some of the resources I have, however you define resources. That could be time, that could be presence, that could be listening, that could be advocacy. But accomplices are saying, I don't just want to learn. I want to actually challenge myself to change something in my life for the betterment of another because they are not afforded that opportunity. And then the last one is co-conspirator. We've had a lot of conversations about co-conspirators since the murder of George Floyd, okay? Co-conspiracy is not doing anything in secret to hurt anybody. Co-conspiratorship means I know exactly what inequity looks like. I am willing to say something when the moment comes. I'm willing to put my safety, not my physical safety, but my privileged safety on the table to protect somebody else who doesn't have that privilege. Okay, co-conspiratorship is the ultimate yes. You can't half do it. It's a commitment to three things. Okay, let's write it down. That's the teacher and me. You know, I'm not going to quiz us. But for some of us, it's helpful to go back and look at it. The first one is you're committed to learning. The second one, we ready? You are committed to understanding your own privilege. The third one is you are willing to risk it, your privilege, your status, to make space for someone else who can't have access to those things. I am not talking about saving people. Okay, co-conspiracy is not saving people. What it is, is acknowledging that you have a power that they don't have. And that if you wield that power, make yourself uncomfortable, you can actually create comfort for others. Like I told us, there's no value judgment on where you decide to be. I just don't want any allies in here thinking you're a co-conspirator if you're just committed to learning. Then we're just an ally and that's okay. Okay, so what I want us all to do is I just want you to take a second and ask yourself, I'm gonna write it down. Who do you think you are now? And who do you wanna be when you grow up? I don't care how old we are in this room, everybody's sagely seasoned. Here's our question. Where do you think you are now and who do you want to be when you grow up? Okay, we're still growing up. We're not grown yet. I'm going to give us some information now. For those of us who identified as ally, there are a couple of different ways that we can show up in the conversation. I'm going to skip this slide and come back to it, okay? Here's the journey. This is where we're going. If you identified as an ally, you are somewhere over here, okay? If you think you're currently an accomplice, 
we're somewhere right in here. But if you're saying you're a co-conspirator, you're doing things that are over here. I don't just want you to figure out where you are. I want you to know that each of those callings is a different place in the journey. Okay, let's do it one more time. An ally is over here. An accomplice is over here, somewhere between belonging and inclusion. And a co-conspirator is living in this space right here, right in between inclusion and equity. So this is, that that's my dog, but this is the chunkiest slide that ever chunked, okay? I know, I know it's chunky. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to describe the four different pieces of this slide. Okay, so that you have a better understanding of what DEI is calling us to do. A lot of times, people think equity is one thing, and it's not. It's four different things. This spectrum, when you do it well, are we ready? I know, you're going to give me a look. It takes 10 years to get to equity. I'm looking at some of your faces. You're like, what? Yes, 10. And here's why. So let's start with the description, okay? You see this arrow at the top? I don't want us to think that the journey to equity is scary. You know you see the word loss in there. I want us to think about it as people don't fear change. They fear loss. This is why people resist this work, because we're asking people to give things up the deeper you go. Okay, so think about it as everybody loves diversity. You know why? Because it feels like equality. And you don't have to give anything up to make everybody feel seen. You know why equity scares people so much? Because people think it's a wicked seesaw. They think you have to give everything up for everyone to feel seen and acknowledged. So think about it as in diversity, there really isn't any loss. That's why most of us can do it. But when I start calling you to belonging and I call you to inclusion and I call you to equity, you have to give up even more. So for belonging, you know, in order to make people feel welcome, you actually have to acknowledge the moments that they don't feel welcome. And a lot of people feel guilty. You know how hard it is to tell people in this country you don't know what other people need to feel belonged? I want us to know we are more segregated than we've ever been before. Most people learn about other cultures on television. Most of us don't even know what we need to belong let alone anybody else. And you see people start feeling guilty here. And they say, are you gonna call me racist? Are you gonna cancel me? Are you gonna shame me if I don't want? That's what this arrow is. The circles are about your strategy. You always wanna be doing two of these things at the same time. So you normally do diversity and belonging together you do belonging and inclusion together, and then you do inclusion and equity together. Okay, now these are the definitions, and down here is an analogy to a party, all right? So let's jump in now that we've been oriented to the chunky slide. Diversity is the beginning of the work. It's not the goal, okay? Diversity is asking do we know who's here? That's all it is. It is saying we have to start building empathy. Diversity is the culture where you focus on culture. This is where we celebrate everyone in all of their differences. Okay? So this looks like race, ability, neurodivergent differences class, sex. Diversity says every single person in this room 
is beautiful for exactly who you are. And we have to celebrate the totality of all of our differences before you call people to talk about inequity. Right, because what normally happens? Don't people say, why do you always have to talk about those people? Why you always gotta focus on those kids? You know why they're saying it? They didn't feel seen first. They didn't feel seen. So diversity is the culture where you celebrate and acknowledge everyone in a campus, in a community, in a classroom for whatever difference works for them. So let me give you a classic example, right? Diversity is not just about how people look. We heard our president give this wonderful bio about me, right? So you know all those things. You also know that I'm black. I identify as a black American, but what you don't know is that I'm from Brooklyn, okay? You know I gotta tell you that. You know I'm from Brooklyn because I tell you I'm from Brooklyn. But why does that matter? Diversity says, Darnisa, what could you tell this room about you beyond just how you look? Because you know there is beauty in you beyond just how you look. Diversity is not calling people into stereotypes. It is calling people in to the deepness of any celebration you need. All right, our next one here is belonging. That's the thing that brought us to this presentation today. Belonging is the sweet spot. When you get this slide deck, I want everybody to put a giant star right on top of it. Okay, I don't know why this dog is going off, but thank y'all for your patience in advance. Okay, she's clearly something's happening, right? But belonging is all about difficult conversations. Okay, so belonging says it's not that we're blaming people, but we have to actually ask. Now that we just heard all these things, right? Who actually feels seen here? Who feels relationship? Excuse me, one second, folks. I'm just gonna stop sharing for one second because I'm gonna try to get this dog to just be a little bit more quiet. Give me one second. Okay, back into the share. This is the beauty of the virtual world, okay? So if we know that diversity is all about acknowledging people, belonging says acknowledgement is not enough. Okay, you actually, here's our sweet word, relationship. Belonging is how you establish a feedback loop. And you ask people questions about, Darnie, so what do you need to feel seen? What do you need that makes you feel like your voice matters, that you matter? So belonging calls us to having the hardest conversation any of us have ever had to have. Many of us may not even think that we're worth belonging yet. Okay, so belonging is when you create <clears throat> affinity spaces and you help people learn how to have difficult conversations. And I want us to be really thoughtful about this. There is nothing wrong with conflict, folks. Pro conflict, when it is facilitated well, is a beautiful and transformative thing. And many of us have been taught to never say anything. So many of us have been taught to never advocate for what we need, to never actually try to truly be in relationship with people. And belonging is the thing that makes students feel seen in classrooms, it makes adults feel celebrated in hallways, and it actually deepens our humanity to each other. And it does not start with blame, right? So I'm not starting by saying, shame on you for not making me feel belonged. I'm saying, I don't know if you know, but I feel really marginalized here. I feel really tokenized. I feel like you only invite me to meetings because I'm black. You know, it's hard to say that, but I'm saying it. That's what it sounds like, okay? Inclusion is one step harder. Inclusion says we can't just talk. We can't just be having the conversations. We actually need to be bringing the voices and the people to the room. Inclusion is not racial replacement, folks. So it's not trying to racially diversify your leadership. 
What inclusion calls us to is perspectives. And this is the reason why. You know, we, at, we often plan things on behalf of people in their absence. Inclusion says, what would it look like for students to be in the room? What would it look like for community members to be in the room? Did anybody catch what just happened? Look, don't we often call the work D E I? You know, it's not an alphabet. It's only like that because we call it DEI because it's an alphabetical order. The work actually goes D I E. That spells die. And I'm not trying to die. But look at why belonging matters. You see, this step says celebrate everybody. This step says bring marginalized voices and people and perspectives to the table. Do you see what doesn't happen if you don't have belonging? You end up tokenizing people. If you don't spend time building relationships, you invite people into rooms that they don't feel like their voices matter, they don't know why you actually want them there, and people feel like you just have them in there for the look of them. You cannot skip belonging. It's the thing that builds trust to get all these perspectives in a room for us to say hard things to each other. Equity's goal is not shaming people. It's having the most difficult conversations necessary to change policy. Okay, look at the sequence. Everyone feels welcome and we've built empathy because we have a culture of celebration. Everything is on the table. But wait a minute, there are some people who don't feel seen. They don't feel acknowledged. They're feeling marginalized. It could be around race, it could be about ability, it could be about sexuality, but something here is happening that is not what we thought would happen. So let's build trust, let's deepen relationship because now once we have done that, I can call people to inclusive collaborative conversations. And what normally happens is we invite people who've never had power, who've never had say, into rooms and then we just expect them to say something and to do something and it doesn't work like that right and the reason we're doing all of that is so that when we get to equity we can actually be in a conversation together to change policies and to change rules and i want to be really thoughtful about this i don't think that our original rule creators just did it and wanted to oppress people. But you know the common denominator of this conversation is we are all oppressed people in different ways. And you know what keeps oppressing us? Rules. You know equality assumes that if you give everybody the same thing, that we can all get to the same goal. But what equality doesn't say is that there are real policies in this country like pay, and job leveling and differentiation in classrooms, where if those things don't exist, not every child and not every adult can be successful. Equality assumes that in this country, everybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, right? And you can't, you can't do that here when your policy is inequitable. So equity's goal is to get the folks in the room so that we can, with this perspective and with this lens, call policies to task and change them. The only way to get to fairness is to change the policies that create inequity. That is the journey. And some of you were like, okay, Darnisa, but what does that mean for my ally, accompliceship, co-conspirator? There is a parallel map to this one. And this is what I am calling you to. Okay. It's the same spectrum, but these are your personal skills. I'm going to leave it up here for a minute so we can look at it. And then I'll do some talking. Now, 
Remember, I started this presentation by saying every single person in here has agency to change the world. I'm not calling you all to equity, but what I'm saying is there are skills that you must know that you have to be able to wield to actually create diversity or create belonging or create inclusion or create equity. So for some of you now who are still wondering where I might place myself, these are your developmental skills. Okay, so diversity is all about calling people in to talk about themselves, right? You actually need to know how to tell stories about yourself. Diversity is not just for race, it's for every single person in here to be able to communicate who we are to each other. And there are some of us in this room who don't yet know who we are in this way. It's not your fault. But can you tell me who you are and how the world has treated you? Because this is the start of the journey. It's storytelling. Okay? And if you can't yet tell stories about yourself and your experiences in your body, in your skin, in your life, then we're at the beginning of the work and that's not a problem. Okay? But you actually have to be able to talk about yourself because what happens is we often look at people of color to do all the story sharing. It is equally exhaustive and it is equally tokenizing. We often call people of color in and we say, tell us what's going on with you. Tell us how the world has treated you to build my awareness. And do you know how I feel on the other side of that? Exhausted. This is an all hands on deck kind of sharing. I'm gonna tell you I'm from Brooklyn. I'm gonna tell you that I celebrate Brooklyn Queens Day. I'm gonna tell you that I can't really say anything with an A-L-L. They all come out all. I don't know how to say ow. I don't know what that, mall, mal, more. I say things like more and call and for and ball and Saturday and yesterday and water. And I'm gonna tell you all of this about myself in diversity because I want you to know who I am beyond just how I look. And if you're not able to yet tell stories about yourself in that way, that's where our ally journey starts. You can't be an ally to me if you can't talk to me about you and you're only looking for me to talk to me about me. It doesn't feel good. Our next level here is belonging. Now, remember we said belonging is our ability to build relationships, but belonging assumes that you as a person know what you need. And if you can't communicate what you need to feel centered and seen and relationship. It's very hard for you to call others to conversations where you can't share what you need with other people. Here's what that one might look like. So my name is Darnisa. You know how hard it was being raised as a Darnisa? And you know, for years in K through 12 and in college, I let my professors call me whatever they wanted to because I didn't feel like I had any power in the room. I didn't feel like I had the right to tell people my name was Darnisa, not Darnisha, not Darnissa, not Darnesia. Stop adding letters to my name. I had a teacher call me Dharma Quata once. Added a M, added a Q, added a U, added two T's, two. And then asked me how to spell it don't know you over here coming up with things that are not me, right? And so an example of belonging is me telling this room, I don't mind if you mispronounce my name, but it bothers me if you stop trying. My name is all I have. And not everybody's great with names. People remember it as darn it, Nisa, okay? But you know, most of the world speaks Spanish, but we still find a way to say Jay and John, don't we? We do. My name is seven letters and I want you to keep trying because if you call me the wrong name, I'm never going to feel relationship with you. That's what it sounds like. It's not yelling. And for some of us, that's about having invisible disabilities. For some of us, it's not being able bodied. For some of us, it's about what it means to be non-binary and have somebody acknowledge your pronouns. 
okay? It's not just about race. But if you don't yet know how to advocate for yourself, then we're right here in our work. Our next one is inclusion. Remember we said inclusion was all about voice and centering voices and helping people to come to rooms to have these powerful conversations. But you remember inclusion on the spectrum is accomplice and co-conspirator. Remember I told you, you have to divest from your privilege. So inclusion is calling you, you see the analogy down there. You're not just trying to dismantle the party. You're trying to dismantle yourself. Do you know what your privileges are? Do you know? Because if you don't, then that's where we have to start. And let me tell you what it sounds like. So I'm a cisgendered, meaning the way that I look as a woman is the way that I identify, heterosexual woman. And I know that cisgendered heterosexual perspectives tend to always show up in leadership rooms. They really do. An example of my divestment is me stepping back, not leaving the room, okay? Not getting fired, stepping back and holding space for someone who identifies as non-binary because that is a perspective we often don't hear, okay? I'm giving us examples that have to do with more than just race. And our last one is equity. And remember we said that equity was all about changing policies and rules. Equity is assuming that you know who you are, you know what your privileges are, you know how to let some of those privileges go, and you're willing to collaborate for a greater good. If you did nothing else in your entire life, but learn the skills on this spectrum, you have done great and good work. This is the work. This is the stuff that you do in between your trainings. This is the stuff that you tell students, you tell your family, you tell your kids. And in a world where a lot of us don't feel like we have any power, I am telling you that every one of these skills is in your locus of control. And because you know you have agency, it prevents us from exhausting others in the work. I'm going to show us one more slide, and then we're going to open it up for a Q&A. We accepted and expected non-closure at the top of the call, but I'm going to end us with uncertainty because the work is never closed. So we didn't run out of time, but I'm going to leave you with some reflective questions. The last slide I'm going to offer for us today is why we even need to do equity and belonging and inclusion in the first place. And the reason for that is that there are four different types of oppression happening all the time. So I'm gonna tell us a story and then we're gonna play a game, okay? So you have to use the chat for this game, okay? So put all your answers in the chat and then we'll just see what happens. This story is called the fish and the fox. This is why you do DBIE. This is why you decide whether you want to be an ally, accomplice, or co-conspirator. So there's this fox that loves fish. And every day he goes down to a pond and he asks the fish a really important question about what it means to be a fish. So the first day, fox goes down to the pond and he shouts out, hey, fish, how are the rocks? And the fish say, well, the rocks are nice, but we're fish. <laughs> we don't really have a purpose for rocks. Fox writes this down, says, okay. The next week, Fox comes back to the pond and he says to the fish again, hey, fish. And this time the fish say, hey, Fox, what up? And this time Fox says, how's the sun? And the fish are like, the sun is great. It puts water, you know, puts algae on the pond. We eat it. And Fox keeps asking the fish all these questions. But one day, Fox realizes he's never asked the fish the most important question. He runs back down to the pond and he shouts out, hey, fish, how's the water? And the fish pop their heads out of the water and they look at him, they look at each other, and then they say, what's water, Fox? That is exactly what ideology is. We 
are the fish. And we don't even know what's there. Ideological oppression is all the stuff that we get taught on TV and in school. It's the stuff that you don't even know you know. So who's beautiful? Who's not? Who's safe? Who's not? Where's a safe place to go? Who are safe people to be with? What does success look like? All of those things are ideology. So anything that you see on TV or that you were learning in school is usually coming out of this wheelhouse right here. Institutional oppression, this is why you have to change policies. Institutional oppression is what happens when your water, the stuff you believe, becomes a law or a rule, even if you don't know it. Most of our discipline policies in school are based off of this ideological belief that Black men are dangerous. We struggle to say that out loud, but this is why most discipline policies in K through 12 education disproportionately impact Black boys and girls, because there's something in these policies that was never supposed to be there and what happened is you have a lot of uninformed people who don't know they don't know making policies that impact people in ways that are very dangerous. Internalized oppression, this one's about you, right? This is what happens when you swallow the water. This is the stuff that you believe, even if you don't know you believe it. You walk in a grocery store, you think somebody looks suspicious, you cross the street on somebody, but you don't really know why. It's because you've been taught something and it's just sitting there, even though we're good people. To be human is to be biased, okay? Every single one of us is biased. There's nothing wrong with it. There's something wrong when we act like we're not. That's all. And then the last one is interpersonal oppression. This is people to people oppression. So we often live down here as a country. We blame people for what they believe, don't we? And then we say, well, shame on you for putting that belief on somebody else. I want us in here to be harder on systems and softer on people. We blame people for things systems create. I told you oppression functions in silence. These four forms of oppression are happening all the time. But it is easier to blame somebody for being racist than to ask hard questions about what we believe and how we have put those beliefs and rules that keep that belief going generation after generation after generation. So now we're going to play a game and we're going to open it up for questions. This game is called When I Say. Okay, When I Say. I'm going to give us an identity and I want us to light the chat up and tell me what you see. Okay. And then when we get to the last game, then I'm going to switch it over to Q and A. So when I say ex con or criminal, who do we see? Ex con or criminal? Who do we see? Right. We see black men, man, male, brown men, man, man. Right. We're seeing a lot of men, white men, black men. But men, oh, we got one woman. Okay, thank you for somebody who's being our outlier. Uneducated, man of color, black, white. Did anyone see Martha Stewart? Anybody see Martha? Come on, you can talk to me in the chat. Anybody see her? Oh, yes, Yvonne. No, we did not see an older white woman, did we? We did not see a wealthy white woman, right? But you know, Martha's on that show snooping Martha's potluck. And based off of what we just said, we all think that Snoop is the criminal. You know he was tried and not convicted, okay? He is not. She is. Next one. When I say basketball player, who do you see? Basketball player. Right, Daphne? Mm -hmm. LeBron, Kyle, Tall, Kobe, Magic Johnson, Felicia. Okay, so we've, I'm seeing tall people, millionaire, black men, Black women, the WNBA, okay? Kobe, there's Kobe again. Did anybody see a non-able-bodied person? Did anybody see anyone in a wheelchair? You know we have a gold-winning Paralympic basketball team here. There's a whole documentary called Murder Ball. 
but we didn't see any non-able-bodied people, did we? We did not. Last one, when I say CEO or president of a company, CEO or president of a company, who do you see? White male, old white man, suit, Elon, Jeff Bezos, older person, black male, white male, stuffed shirt, rich white male, good old white boy. So like, we, look, we've got white men, older white men, predominantly white men. Did anybody see me? Did anybody see me? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the president introduced me in this way twice. Said that I was the CEO successfully of two organizations. You see that? This is how really good people create non-belonging. How could we all be from so many different places, but we all saw the same thing? It's the water, and we just played a game on it. And I've been leading us for 45 minutes, and you didn't even see me. That is why we have to do this work, because we've all been messaged something that prevents us from truly seeing every student, every child, every adult in a role. So I thank you all for this time, and I am not upset that you didn't see me, but because inequity is predictable, I didn't expect you to see me, because no one usually does. We just gonna sit in there. Now I'm gonna open it up for questions and thank you all for your presence. Wow, and we thank you so much for opening our eyes. Uh, people can ask questions in the uh, in the chat or uh, use the raise hand feature. And I see much clapping going on here. I can't see any raised hands, oh. but I'm, that doesn't mean there aren't any. We have a raised hand from Nayir. Nayir, yes. Um, I'll send her a request on mute. Hello, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Um, my name is Nayir. Um, I'm the president of Black Student Union at SUNY New Pulse. Um, I was wondering if you could give me any advice on how I can protect and maintain Black spaces while still offering opportunities for non-Black people and people of color to be co-conspirators? This is a great question. Thank you. I think the first one is the protection of space for Black students starts all the way at the top with our administration. And a lot of times people don't understand the importance of affinity space, and they think it's really just about joking. But I think it's going to be really important for the university, not saying they don't, but to understand that affinity space is also for healing. And that many black students never have a chance to talk about key things like colorism and our own internalized protection. So the first one is just a wise statement on the value of affinity space. Because when people realize that most black people don't get to learn about who we are, because we're being called to help other people learn about who they are, it becomes a really powerful way to explain that space. And then I would partner that by saying, it's not enough just for black students to have affinity. We would want white students and other students and other identities in affinity space as well. We don't want to message that only black people should be doing affinity. This is a campus conversation. So I would say present the why of affinity space that it builds value for people to do that diversity slide work, the identity development, and talk about who we are and heal. The second one is asking for affinity space to be held for all cultural groups on campus. And then I would partner with the Office of Student Events to plan multicultural learning events. But I don't think that the Black Student Organization should be owning the total learning of all the cultural groups on campus. So I'm gonna push us to share that work now. And I think the responsibility of the university is to create other affinity spaces for other leaders of color and partner with you to develop programming with those other affinity spaces that identify learning for everyone. So I hope that that answer was helpful. Um, we have a question from Sophia. Okay. 
Is it going to be in the chat or Sophia, are you going to come off mute? I just came off mute. Awesome. I, um, I just want to just say you are just absolutely amazing, Dr. Monty Jackson. Thank you so much. Um, I'm an alum and I'm so proud to, to be that you are a speaker and that you're just so amazing. So my question for you is when you work with organizations that and, and I, I love the way I'm a diversity and inclusion practitioner myself and a consultant. So when you're working with organizations that you're walking them through that path of diversity, belonging, inclusion, equity. And they say, well, we're good with the birth part because we just don't have the time, the money, the, you know, whatever they say, are there, are there reasons or I call them excuses? How do you help? What do you use to move them to oh, move so around the resources, do what they have to do? Like, what is your most like go-to that, that you have seen shift people? Yeah, it's one statement. We ready for it? Urgency. An absence of competency is harm. And really urgent people do harm in their urgency if they have not learned how to be urgent. Diversity is where you build the learning that supports people in understanding how to be urgent. So that statement again is urgency and absence of competency is harm. And really urgent people with no skills to be urgent do harm in their good intentions. Diversity is about the professional development to help people even understand what the four eyes are and what inequity is. And Sophia, if they tell you they want to jump it, then we pull the hard consultant question, which is, can you show me how your organization or school has a culture that focuses on culture right now? Can you show me your values? Do we have competencies? Can you show me the professional developments that you have done to support people and learning skills about implicit bias and culture? And you know they're going to look you in the face. And when they have nothing, you say, I love how eager you are that you want to start in belonging. But this quick little assessment and gap analysis is suggesting that we should go back to the beginning and do some foundational skills. And it's really done in partnership. I'm slowing you down because I care enough about you to make sure that we have the foundational skills to make sure harm doesn't happen. And a lot of times we call people to things that they have not learned how to do and we hurt people. And that's that. To me, that's the only way that I'm going to meet that conversation. And if they keep telling you they want to start in belonging, this is not an organization you need to be partnered with. Because their intention for care is not there yet. And people will get hurt and they will blame it on you because they're going to say she took us through the journey. So a little bit of coaching, a little bit of hard truths, but I hope that that was helpful for you, Sophia. Right? The quick gap analysis to ask them, where are your artifacts to suggest that we have focused on culture? If they have never PD'd, if they've never done any learning, if they don't have any skills that they can articulate values, they're very much at the beginning. And belonging assumes you have all those things already. Okay. I can stay a little bit past six if we want to do a few more questions, Lisa, at all. So I'm happy. I know there's a ton. Um, I, I have, there's one in the chat that perhaps I can read to save you hunting it up. Uh, how do you come to terms with someone who thinks they may be an accomplice or a co-conspirator when they aren't? So that's a really great question. Thanks, Crystal, for that. I'm going to tell you that that's why I put that developmental slide in there for us. My role in life is to gracefully say the hardest things that people really need to hear about themselves. And so for me, if somebody tells me that they are a co-conspirator or an accomplice, I'm gonna ask them, can you tell me when you have stepped away from your own privilege for others? So I don't tell people how they should identify I just start asking people harder questions about where they've been because I'm the kind of person that in those questions, I'm hoping they realize they're not there yet. So that's my personal practice as a coach and as a facilitator is to call people in to actually tell me how you know that's where you are and to take them on this reflective journey of like, if that's who you are and where you've been, can you tell me who you are and where you've been? 
And then I'm going to say, I don't think you're at co-conspirator yet, but I definitely hear some ally. I don't want to undermine the fact that people want to take a stance, but I'm always going to tell people the truth about where I think they are. And I'm going to tell them why with care, because I'm saying it so that they can have some data about themselves to do something differently. Okay, so um, there's another question in the chat. Um, you spoke earlier about the loss of power. This mm -hmm. feels really difficult. I don't even know what it looks like apart from requiring people in power suffering a financial loss. Mm -hmm. How else can it manifest itself? So some other examples of loss are, you know, in the United States, we're all taught to be highly competent. And the loss for a lot of us is actually admitting we don't know. We are perfectly imperfect people doing perfectly imperfect work imperfectly. And we've all been taught to be perfect. So the loss could be, I have to admit I don't know. I have to tell myself that there are things about myself I don't know. I have to actually tell people how I'm feeling. There are some people in this room who are so conflict averse that you won't even advocate for your own belonging because you don't want to get into a difficult conversation. So loss could be, I'm actually asking you to advocate. I'm asking you to tell yourself and others what you need. Loss could be, I'm worried about losing my job. The hard thing to say is inclusion really scares people because they start to worry that they're going to be racially replaced. Right? Some people are saying, am I going to lose my job for the diversity we want? So people are normally worried about having their status, right? Will people judge me now? Will I be called, you know, racist? Some people, the loss is certainty. You know, because inequity is predictable, we always know what's going to happen. We always know. And the minute you create equity, you no longer have predictability. And some people would rather things be predictable and unfair than unpredictable and fair. So just wanted to give a few more examples of what that could look like. And I saw a hand raised in the uh, hand raised feature from Steven Spasada. Um, I believe he may have lowered his hand. Let me see if I can find him. Oh, here we go. Daphne, there are a lot of talks on my website. Um, Daphne just asked, where can we find future talks by Dr. Monte Jackson? So that's the one thing, like I really am the only Darnisa Monte Jackson in the whole world. So if you follow my LinkedIn, if you're always checking up on my website, all my podcasts are there, all my keynotes. For those of you who love the four eyes, there's a whole keynote up there about the meat and potatoes of it. Like we really get into it on the website. So that, and I'm usually featured on podcasts every few months, and then a book will be coming soon. Stay tuned, okay? So I gotta plug that one, uh, and that'll be for 2022 Christmas stockings, okay? So next year. We have a question from Sienna. I think we should probably take one final question and then call it an evening. Yes, okay. and thanks, Paola. Paola's over here plugging pre-orders and, and the website flow content. Thank you. Um. um Hi, hi, Dr. Uh, Armante Jackson. I appreciate your time and your insight and your nice wisdom. Nice to meet you. Um, yeah, nice to meet you. Um, so I am a, basically a digital rep for the photo community, um, a community that's in desperate need of having stories be um, diversified and having marginalized communities pushed to the forefront, um, especially because it shapes so much of our history and our culture and trends and um, all that jazz. Um, so I'm wondering, um, but we're also a business too. So, right, we can't offer lower rates, like for memberships that like reparations kind of away, but cause obviously illegally immoral, all that jazz. But I was wondering if like a way to create more opportunities, um, or to like do this work is to just create more opportunities for, um, people to tell their stories and in, in a way that amplifies it as far as possible. I do a lot of work in the arts. 
So this answer is going to be really nuanced in ways that some people might not understand, but I'm going to start from the top. The thing about the arts is the arts are often struggling to have real accurate representation. This is not for Sienna. This is for the room who's listening as I answer this question for Sienna. I don't want anyone to feel non belonging. Okay, and so representation is huge, but one of those first relationships Sienna that comes up for me is the assumptions that a lot of organizations make about what communities of color want to even be seen. And I think that the first step is building authentic communication loops with people who are allowing BIPOC community members to create our own narrative, even sometimes in absence of the bottom line of a company. So really, I think the way in is, are we willing to create mentorship pipelines? Are we right. willing to create a standing group that is representing photographers of color so that that perspective is finding its way to organizations? Because as long as people of color are being asked to contribute their thoughts, we're not truly going to be fully included. And a lot of arts based organizations often will give grants to communities to do the projects we want. And not the projects they want. And this is really about belonging and inclusion. If a pipeline does not exist for artists or photographers to feel seen and heard, we will never truly authentically call them to the table. And sometimes the first step, right, is incubating a program, creating a steering committee, something that's giving voice to the community in a way that builds some trust for photographers to actually feel like this is a space that could hear me, that would represent me and would represent my viewpoint. Go ahead, Sian, I saw yeah. you jump in. I know, I, I get excited. Um, so basically it's like you have to do whatever it is to like nurture an environment for people to say what they want, how they want to be represented out in the world. And then you can offer like your resources, you know, your time, your money, your access to tools or whatever to um, make that. And I want to um, say representation more known. In the arts, unfortunately, a lot of times that we do this, it is done only to impact the optics of how the organization looks to impact. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not interested in being performative. <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> You're here after six, so this is the after dark hard conversation, which is it can't exactly. be saving. It can't be a recruitment network for the sake of us looking more racially oh. diverse and optic. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So this will require, remember we said a co-conspirator is a willing to divest from privilege? Your organization or other arts-based organizations would need to be investing things into BIPOC community without the consideration of the organization's bottom line. This is oh, the goodness okay. of it, the humanity of it. Our resources are allowing us to create this structure, which exists not as our incubation, but as its own 501c3. You see, that is a different ask, but it starts with hiring people in your organization that are focused on accessing community voice. Like there actually yeah. has to be someone who owns that and is doing that. And then someone who's building relationships, because what happens is we don't want this to look like saving. We often position yeah. artists of color to be saved by predominantly white organizations because we need it. And that type of dynamic is never going to get us to authentic partnership, which is my goal. Right? And um, let me say it again, right? We have to create an incubator. That is not just for the saving and optics of an organization. It is an actual network that has advancement opportunities. It has a steering committee. They have representation and resources are being used to support them in their founding. But this is because we know the average organization requires a million dollar investment to get it really, really going. So thanks, Anthony, for the plus one. Sienna, I know you have a ton. Come find me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I already followed you on Twitter and I'll send you a LinkedIn message. And thank you so much for your time. And thanks for and thanks letting me have the floor. <laughs> and listening to an arts based question. I do a ton of work in the arts. And then if you go to my LinkedIn, Sienna, I've got an article up there about equity in the arts. Okay, I'll check it out right after this. Thank you so much. So I, I, I regret to draw our evening to a close. I think we could go on for some time, but uh, out of respect for both our guests and for uh, Dr. Amante Jackson, I, I want to thank uh, all of the participants for joining us here for your engagement. 
Uh, and certainly a, a, a profound thank you to Dr. Amante Jackson for sharing so many wonderful insights. Yep, that's our. Th thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being being our our distinguished speaker this evening. We we all learned a lot. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, everyone, and it was truly a joy. I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Be well and safe, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye.